This podcast episode reflects the opinions of the hosts and guests and not of Greenberg Shoring LLP. This episode is presented for informational purposes only, and it is not intended to be construed or used as general legal advice nor a solicitation of any type. Hello, everybody. This is Mike Taylor at the Greenberg Traurig Law Firm. I am the chair of the Greenberg Traurig OSHA practice group. I am based out of our Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia offices. Our firm has offices all over the world with about 2,200 lawyers. If you'd like to learn more about me or our OSHA practice group, please go to www.gtlaw.com. Dot com. Today we have a special guest, Jordan Barrett. Jordan joined OSHA as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Labor for Occupational Safety and Health on April 13, 2009. He previously served as Special Assistant to the Assistant Secretary of Labor for OSHA from 1998 to 2001. He was also on the House Education and Labor Committee as a senior labor policy advisor for health and safety from 2007 to 2009. He also worked on workplace safety and health issues for the U.S. Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board from 2002 to 2007. He was a health and safety specialist for the AFL-CIO from 2001 to 2002, and he directed the safety and health program for the American Federation of State, County, Municipal Employees from 1982 to 1998. He also created and wrote the award-winning web blog, Confined Space, from 2003 to 2007. Welcome, Jordan. Thank you. Good to be here. Hey, it's a very pleasure to have you here with us today. One of the questions I have is about your tenure with OSHA in um, 2009 and then the years following through that. What would you say were some of the agency's best accomplishment during that tenure? Well, yeah, it was a long tenure. And in fact, uh, both uh, I and David Michaels, who was the assistant secretary, uh, spent longer at OSHA in those uh, seven to eight years than any other previous uh, either head of OSHA or even a deputy assistant secretary, at least a political deputy. And there were a lot of accomplishments. I think the ones probably that, that stand out in terms of those that the public would notice uh, most, I think, was uh, our issuance of, of several important standards. Uh, first and foremost was the uh, silica standard that protects, uh, you know, a lot of construction workers and other workers against uh, deadly silica dust. Um, also issued a, a beryllium standard. Um, we updated a lot of the record keeping um, requirements. For example, um, it's now required, uh, employers are now required to notify OSHA anytime there is a hospitalization or um, an amputation or the loss of an eye, in addition to the previous requirements, which were uh, notifying OSHA in the case of a fatality or a catastrophe. So that that, also uh, increases OSHA's ability to kind of get to where it needs to be. Um, Otherwise, I mean, kind of behind the scenes, more um, uh, accomplishments were really trying to refocus the agency uh, more toward vulnerable workers, um, both in terms of um, kind of approaching them in terms of outreach, uh, compliance assistance, training, uh, Harwood grants, um, and uh, just general relationships with those organizations that have, um, uh, you know, better access to vulnerable workers than OSHA would normally have. Right, right. You, you mentioned rulemaking. Um, if you had a magic pen, um, and you could rewrite the laws in terms of um, what OSHA has to do to promulgate a rule. What would you do? I mean, is is the process broken? How is it that EPAs promulgate so many rules, but OSHA doesn't? Yeah, it's. I would say the process is pretty much broken. You know, it took 20 years to get the uh, silica standard out. It took about 20 years to get the beryllium standard out. Believe it or not, we although we were, I think, fairly active on the regulatory side, we did not complete any standards 
that were begun in our administration. That's how long it takes, except for some of the record keeping regulations, smaller things. Um, and I do not believe that the founding fathers of OSHA um, ever intended on it taking 10 to 20 years for a single uh, regulation to be issued or updated. Um, that That is not, not, not a good way to run a, a worker protection agency. So what you have is a situation where, for example, you know, OSHA's got, you know, OSHA has, regulates probably 600 chemicals, um, and almost all of those are the same regulations that that, that uh, were issued in, in, in the early days of OSHA, which means they're based on science from the 1960s and 1970s. Um, the other thing OSHA has is an enormous number, and probably in the hundreds of uh, standards that were passed, that were issued also in those years, that basically adopted industry consensus standards. Now, those industry consensus standards typically get updated every three to five years, whereas OSHA still basically enforcing industry consensus standards from 50 years ago. So obviously, it's not working. And in terms of you know what can be done, I don't have a whole lot of answers. I mean, one thing that definitely should be done, and this is actually included in the Protecting America's Workers Act, which has been introduced in the House and Senate uh, every year for the last probably decade at least, would be to kind of repeat the allowance that OSHA was given in its early days, which is, which is uh, to basically adopt uh, a version of all the industry consensus standards without going through the full in, without going through the um, full rulemaking process. So that would at least update uh, all of the standards that OSHA has on the books now, and that would be a major accomplishment. In terms of new standards, new hazards, there really needs to be something. I don't have all the answers here, but there needs to be something to make a much faster uh, regulatory process without losing the you know the robust uh, work, uh, public input that OSHA has. I think OSHA has probably the, the best public input processes of, of any agency in the federal government. But between you know that process and various other things that have gotten tacked on, such as Sabrifa, the small business, various assorted uh, uh, court decisions, executive orders, that type of thing, it just uh, it, it, it again basically breaks the system, especially as the uh, the originators intended. Right, right. I totally agree. I, I, I think I think it's also uh, fractured and needs to be repaired. Did you or did the agency when you were there um, engage in any kind of negotiated rulemaking? Uh, and if so, what was your experience with that? Was it positive, negative? Yeah, we didn't. I mean, we did not engage in any formal negotiated rulemaking. Um, there have been occasions where OSHA has engaged in that, uh, for example, in the steel erection standard. Uh, I personally have never been a big fan of that. It's it's a very it's a long process, as most rulemaking is. It doesn't always come out with the same with the best product, and I think uh, you know OSHA tends to get sued anyway afterwards. It also tends to favor you know those with more resources. I, I was involved in the negotiated rulemaking very early in my career. This was with EPA, uh, the AHERA uh, regulation that dealt with asbestos in schools, and you know they required. Uh, you know, me to be on site every single day for weeks at a time. At the same time, I was the only, well, actually, there were two of us running the entire program uh, uh, at AFSME. And uh, yeah, both of us were pretty much there as opposed to these large law firms, no offense, but large law firms, um, you know, who could, you know, send people there, you know, every day um, and uh, or n numbers of people there every day and still run their normal operations. So that's always been a problem. Now, we did do one thing we did do with beryllium. Beryllium had been something that OSHA had been struggling with for many years. With, there was incredible industry opposition, despite the fact that it was well known that, that OSHA needed a, a new beryllium standard. And in fact, uh, the Department of Energy had moved forward on that considerably beyond OSHA. So the steelworkers did get together with the um, beryllium industry, and uh, they, they worked through a number of the, you know, the key issues, such as what the per permissible exposure limit was and kind of outlined a standard that they could both agree with. And we kind of jumped in there and said, well, to speed things up, you know, we will uh, try to issue a standard based on, you know, what you all have agreed to. And uh, obviously we're still having to go through, you know, the, the, the various hoops and everything that OSHA normally has to go through, but that definitely sped up the process and decreased the, the kind of, uh, you know, litigation, there was still some litigation, but decreased you know, significantly the amount of litigation and opposition to that standard when we finally did issue it. Do you think that some standards or industries are more prone to have successful negotiated rulemaking than others? For example, the PSM standard, very good standard, but to me needs to be updated to reflect uh, the current status of cover processes in America. Would that be a standard that you think that could 
survive negotiated rulemaking, so to speak? I do think there's a great value in having you know a maximum amount of of public input, which means industry input, labor input, and other you know input into all OSHA standards. And and as you know, when the proposal is issued, there's a formal you know comment period. There are hearings, public hearings, where anyone can testify. And a little known uh, opportunity, I think, unique to OSHA is, you know, if you if you're an o, if you're a witness at an OSHA regulatory hearing, you also get to question other witnesses hearing. So for the, all of you who you know are not attorneys but kind of always wanted to be attorneys, you know, that's that's your opportunity to get up there and question witnesses. Um, and then there's obviously a you know a full you know review period after that uh, for the hearings. Um, so there is certainly opportunity for all of that input. Um, as opposed to again a negotiated rulemaking, which which um, you know tends to go for the least common denominator. And again, from my experience, um, uh, both in terms of the resources put in and the results that come out of it, um, haven't convinced me that that's uh, probably the best way to go. Right, right. And one of the other accomplishments uh, that you had um, with Dr. Michaels was the introduction of the press releases. Right? Well, no, we did not introduce the press release. We did not invent the press release. OSHA, throughout its history, has always issued press releases, uh, big enforcement cases. So, was it um, going back? Because I was on a panel with Dr. Michaels, I think it was right around 2009 uh, before OSHRIC. So, I just don't recall. So, press releases did exist before your tenure. It just it wasn't as, as the magnitude. Is that right? Well, yeah, it's, it, it's hard to say. I mean, so. Let me let me let me talk a little bit about a kind of a, a policy slash philosophical background, and then and then to what we actually did. Now sure. OSHA, as you know, is a is a very small agency. I think the the um, I, th I think maybe this year for the first time the budget will will approach seven hundred million dollars a year, which is barely a you know a hiccup uh, you know federal government. I mean uh, EPA's uh, budget is somewhere between I think eight and nine billion a year. So OSHA is a tiny agency. Uh, you know, really has you know very small staff very little capacity to really, um, you know, uh, really conduct the mission that it was assigned when it was when it was um, created in, in 1971. Um, so it, it was always our um, kind of our focus when we were there to leverage those resources as much as we could and to really try to make ourselves look bigger than we really were. Um, one way to do that was to make sure you know, there, there were, I mean, OSHA can do relatively few inspections a year and citations and the OSHA penalties, especially then OSHA penalty levels were very low. They're still low, but they were, they were much lower uh, at that point. So what do you do to really, you know, leverage your influence? And one of those things is not just to um, issue press releases, because again, OSHA had always done that as all enforcement agencies have, but also to issue more press releases and to more issue more impactful press releases. So one of the first things I did, and I, got, I was there, you know, a good year before David arrived, he was confirmed the first thing we did was basically simply lower the threshold um, of, of where press releases would be issued um, previously it was i think any citation over seventy-five thousand, and i think we reduced that to any citation over forty thousand uh, dollars there would automatically be a press release and then you issue other press releases depending on the issue if it's something you really wanted to emphasize uh, for example a workplace violence citation which may be only seven thousand dollars but it's, it's an area that osha was really moving into and wanted Spread the word that this is something we're serious about. So I'd issue a press release for a smaller uh, one than that. Now, so we that was the first thing we did, and then we also tried to make them a little bit more informative and descriptive. Not only about you know obviously what we think went wrong, um, um, and also what some of the solutions, what some of the ways you could prevent that. Um, and also as we moved in, we we started you know getting more. Um, I, I think. Uh, more uh, introducing probably more rhetoric and passion in, into the press releases and and David was quoted once and it was it was a somewhat un, inaccurate quote but nevertheless he was quoted once as saying we want to um, kind of use press releases well basically you know use press releases to regulate uh, use to regulate through shame in other words shaming employers into um, using press releases to shame employers into doing the right thing um, and it, you know, it, a it wasn't it wasn't really uh, regulation by shaming, it was more enforcement by shaming. Um, and and it wasn't so much shaming as it is really uh, trying to pressure and uh, kind of disincentivize uh, cutting corners. Um, we it, we received a lot of criticism for that. Again, not you know the kind of the image that we had invented the press release, which again we did not, but we did again increase the number of press releases, and I think we tried to increase the impact of press release. 
Um, and there were two two things that came out of that, I think. One is there, there have actually been academic studies showing that a, a, a press release will have an impact far beyond uh, just the, the actual citation. I mean, if you issue a citation to a company and nobody talks about it, that company you know, is impacted, hopefully, if it's a smallish company that, that would be responsive to a relatively small OSHA fine. Um, but if you issue a press release, you're not only impacting uh, that company, but also you know, other companies in that general geographic area, um, as well as um, you know, companies within that industry, assuming it gets you know, uh, attention and, 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 and publicity in, in industry publications. So you really are uh, kind of leveraging OSHA's resources. And that's what, and, and there, again, there have been academic studies showing that that actually is the case. Um, secondly, and this is more anecdotal, but nevertheless, it's, not, it's an anecdote that's been repeated a number of times. Um, I've talked to many uh, employer attorneys who have told me that their um, their clients have come to them and and basically said, "Listen, you know, uh, how do we how do we get away from these OSHA press releases? You know, we don't care about OSHA penalties; they're so small, they're pretty much a cost of doing business. But we really don't want you know the the uh, a press release issued with our name in it." and you know, these attorneys' response were, were basically don't get cited, you know, make sure your workplace is safe. Um, so if in fact the, you know, the impact of having, you know, more uh, press releases and harder hitting press releases was, um, um, you know, influencing employers to make their workplaces safer, then I think that was a success. Uh, you know, uh, I am an OSHA practitioner myself and I do concur. I, I can tell you from my perspective, it was, you know, obviously, um, let's say an oil refining, for example, didn't want to have a press release. But if they read a press release that dealt with PSM, uh, the idea would be I'd get calls and say, hey, well, maybe we need to take a second look at uh, mechanical integrity. And um, and, and that's the, the interest that I saw in terms of, you know, trying to improve um, workplace safety and health. So I, I do think those those press releases did have some value in uh, making employers not feel comfortable that they're, everything's always okay and required them to, to take a second look, and which is always good, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, anything you can get to, uh, you know, I mean, you know, some employers will do the right thing anyway. What? Um, you know, there are others, though, that, you know, kind of hope, nothing will ever ha bad will happen and you know maybe osha will never show up you know they're more complacent um than uh, than others and this you know this could you know actually kind of hopefully these kind of things can a little shake them out of their complacency right you mentioned um about the budget about epas compared to osha's budget and i don't remember the number but i remember um right around the, the time that you became um deputy assistant secretary in 2009 I think I recall that at one point there was either a thousand or eleven hundred or twelve hundred OSHA uh, enforcement inspectors, and today there's maybe what eight hundred. Am I off base on that? Yeah, that's about right. The yeah, during the uh, latter days of the Trump administration, OSHA hit an all-time low uh, for enforcement staff. Now that was partly a result of the budget. So basically, OSHA had basically been flat funded since 2010. And uh, also a result of OSHA just doing a poor job of hiring uh, during the Trump administration. So what what would you do if you had a magic pin to try to get back to the normal staffing? I mean, is that going to be a problem for the agency over the next five years, regardless of who's president? Well, it always is. And I, and I, and I, would, I would also argue, first of all, that even getting back to the normal staffing is not good enough. I mean, right now... Um, you know the AFLCIO does these calculations every year, and what they've they've found that um, the uh, you know if OSHA were to issue were to inspect every workplace uh, just once, um, it would take uh, over 160 years. Um, and even you know back in the early days of the uh, Obama administration, you know I, I think that number was maybe 130, 140 uh, years. So that's not good. Um, you know, I mean, is it too much to ask that OSHA should be able to inspect every workplace once a century, maybe, or even, uh, you know, much more frequently than that? Um, you know, I mean, you know, OSHA is responsible for, you know, uh, something like 8 million workplaces around the country. Um, and in between the, the numbers you were citing were only federal OSHA. Even if you double that, you know, when you consider the state plans, you're still not any close to um, where you should be um, to have, um, you know, a, a real presence in, in, in most American workplaces. Um, let me put it this way, my chance, you know, if I if I decide to go out today and I'm running errands all day and decide I'm going to uh, drive 20 miles over the speed limit uh, all day long today around the D.C. area, I'll, I'll probably come home with about 20, uh, 
20 tickets, um, just, just from <laughs> apartment tickets, assuming I don't get pulled over. So my, and you know, I could, uh, if I, you know, run around DC all day and put workers up on, uh, on, on roofs without uh, fall protection, the chances are uh, nobody will notice. Right. Yeah, that's so true. Um, and not in addition to understaffing, um, you know, put to you this way, I often tell folks that being a compliance officer is a is a noble position. And in my view, uh, they're asked to do the impossible. And what I mean by that, well, one day they could be in an oil refinery. The next day they could be at a bakery. The next day they could be at a hospital, a construction site. I mean, that's a daunting task. What is your view about the kind of training that the compliance officers receive while they're employed with the agency? Does it need to be improved? And if so, how would you go about doing that? Well, yeah, training is important. OSHA has a, a training center, as you probably know, in the in Chicago suburbs. Um, and it's a very good training center. It's always been very highly renowned. You know, OSHA, new inspector, you basically go through about three years of courses before you're you know, turned loose. Um, and there are specialized courses, for example, in PSM and other areas. But you're right. I mean, you know, they have to kind of have to be jacks of all trades. Um, and uh, they could always use more training to, to reach the expertise uh, level that they need. Now, OSHA also has kind of alliances and arrangements with a lot of industry associations where, you know, our, our inspectors uh, could also get um, additional training, more specialized training, which is also important. But again, yeah, I mean, it's, it, given the size of the agency, there is no choice but to, you know, have, have your expertise uh, spread widely. Um, California, on the other hand, and this is partly through legislation, but, you know, they have a, a, a much larger cadre of PSM specialists, very exclusively PSM specialists, um, that focus on, you know, California's refineries and other, other PSM, uh, facilities, um, than, than OSHA, than federal OSHA does. And again, a lot of that is, you know, again, comes back to a, uh, function of, of not having enough money to hire adequate staff to really do that. Right, right. Yeah, it all comes back to that. During your tenure um, uh, with Dr. Michaels, what can you tell my audience about the oversight Federal OSHA has on state plan states? And did you come across any particular states where you thought, oh, gee, gosh, hey, you're falling behind here? Yeah, the state plans have always been uh, challenging, I should say. Uh, I've been involved with state plans for a long time. I was, you know, when I was at AFSME, um, you know, AFSME uh, is, is a union of public employees, and, and there are a lot of people that still don't know that OSHA uh, does not cover public employees, um, except in state plan states. Um, so I, you know, spent the first, you know, good part of my career uh, dealing only with OSHA state plan states. So I was, uh, you know, I was very, very familiar with how they operate. And basically, some of them are very good and some of them aren't. Um, but overall, it's kind of like herding cats. Um, you know, you have a whole lot of, you've got 21 full state plans plus another um, five uh, public employee only state plans. And, uh, you know, they, they kind of all want to do their own thing, even though it, it is federal OSHA's responsibility to oversee them and to ensure that they are, quote unquote, at least as protective as uh, the federal program. So a few things when we first got there, um, um, you know, we again wanted to kind of try to tighten that up. And some of the things we did um, were for example, require all the state plan states to adopt OSHA um, national emphasis program, because we figured when OSHA had compiled enough evidence uh, to actually issue a national emphasis program, and we didn't do all that many, it was supposed to be a national emphasis program, which meant, you know, not just in the, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the 26 states or the 20, 29 states that, that uh, federal OSHA um, enforced in. Um, a few other things we did, we tried to, you know, at that point, OSHA penalties were even lower than they are now, as I mentioned before, and most of the state plans were even lower than federal OSHA, and some of the state plans were, were significantly lower. Um, I think I think when I got there, OSHA, the average OSHA penalty was somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, between $1,500 and $2,000, um, and, you know, the state plans, some of the state plans were as down as low as two and $300. Now, in 2016, Congress... Um, uh, raised OSHA's penalties, um, and uh, we required the states to follow through, and uh, some of them still have not done that. Um, and they resisted. They resisted the uh, national emphasis program thing, and they resisted a number of other things that we tried to do as well. Um, 
we the, the pro, so that that's the kind of the the issues that we have with the states. They kind of want to do their own thing and and uh, don't necessarily uh, interpret being just as effective uh, as federal OSHA the same way the feds do. Um, and they don't, you know, also, you know, they quite legitimately argue that they're funded very well, which is which is true. Um, the, the state plan funding line item in the OSHA budget tends to lag behind the rest of the OSHA budget, which is not very good as I uh, anyway. One of the problems, kind of the uh, the structural problems there, is that OSHA, federal OSHA, doesn't have that many tools uh, to address problems with the state plans. Basically, what the only tool that OSHA, federal OSHA, has is is the death penalty. You know, if, it, if it's not satisfied with what a state is doing, OSHA can remove, um, you know, that OSHA state plan. Now that doesn't really do anybody any good. Um, OSHA ends up, you know, having to enforce all that, which means they they end up spending a lot more money. Public employees in that state lose their coverage. Um, and it takes a long time to do that. And you know, again, nobody really wins at the outcome of that. We did try to try to try to build a little bit more flexibility into it. Um, you may all recall, I think in 2010-ish, somewhere around there, uh, OSHA um, changed its um, uh, residential roofing requirements. Um, residential when the, when the roofing standard had come out, um, I think in the 90s, in the early 90s, um, residential was essentially exempted from a lot of the requirements of the roofing standard. Um, for what may or may not have been good reasons back then, but whatever the reasons were back then, they no longer applied in, in, in 2010, 2011. So we basically brought uh, residential roofing up to the same the same level as commercial roofing, which it was intended to be when the standard was issued in the first place. And we also obviously, you know, told the state plans that they had to do that as well. Um, they resisted, about a half dozen of them resisted, and we finally, you know, got most of them on board. Um, Arizona um, kind of came right out there and said, you know, we're, not only are we not doing this, we're, we're passing a law saying that we are not going to stick to the old ones, and and uh, we weren't going to take that. So we basically arranged to, to basically uh, federal OSHA would take over uh, Arizona's construction sector. Now we can just declare that there's there's a whole bunch of stuff in the in the OSHA law about what has to go on and other regulations, and it became kind of a two-year process and. When we finally got to the end of that process where we said, all right, we're taking over your construction sector, they basically changed their minds. <laughs> they said, all right, well, <laughs> so we went through this whole long, lengthy, painful process only to be basically back where we should have been for that. Um, we've also tried, you know, doing other things with some of the other states. Some of the states had problems because of funding issues. We, for example, took over a good part of Hawaii's plan because they didn't have the funding even to run the state plan and kind of helped them get back up to the level they needed to be at. And we did other other things that we managed to do as well to try to put a little bit more flexibility in there than just again just the the uh, death penalty. But ultimately, it's way too difficult. The whole system is rigid to really oversee the state plans adequately, and and something should be changed in the law to to fix that as well. To be sure, to be sure. And it, correct me if I'm wrong too. Is it does Federal OSHA uh, fund half of the state plan state? Is that right? In other words, yeah, federal OSHA is required to fund up to half. Now, a lot of the states uh, overspend, and what, what I mean by that is they they will, you know, even though OSHA OSHA kind of establishes what the state needs to spend, mm -hmm. and, and OSHA will match that amount. But some of the states overmatch. In other words, they'll actually put more money into the state program than is actually required by OSHA. Now, that's that the number of states that overmatch and the level of overmatching has gone down over the last several years because of you know basic budget issues and again OSHA being flat funded. But yeah, OSHA does have to fund at least half of the state plan. Right. And as you're aware, OSHA recently published or promulgated a, an emergency temporary standard for COVID in healthcare settings. My question is, does that mean now that all the state plan states have to adopt that standard or be even more stringent in that standard? It's kind of an unusual situation because... These standards are normally supposed to be for about six months because it's an emergency. But I was just curious as to whether now does that mean these state plan states have to either incorporate this standard by reference or have the standard but be more vigorous? Yeah, they do have to adopt it by reference. And I don't know exactly. I mean, that's a good question. I'm not sure exactly uh, how that works now. As you as you mentioned, it's it's. Uh, emergency temporary standards are only supposed to last for six months. Nobody's quite sure what happens at the end of that six months if OSHA can't then issue a permanent standard, which obviously they're able to. 
Normally, uh, after OSHA passes, issues a standard, state plans are given six months uh, to adopt that standard, either an identical standard or a standard that is, you know, more stringent. I mean, obviously, there would be different deadlines now, and um, that's a good question. I'm not sure exactly what deadline uh, OSHA has given the state plans to adopt uh, the standard. And one final question, uh, Jordan. When you were there, were you, was the agency working on a airborne transmission disease standard? And if so, do you know if it's still in the works in that maybe that's what will end up being promulgated once the emergency standard for COVID expires? Um, well, actually, OSHA was working on a uh, an overall uh, infectious disease standard, not just airborne. Probably, as you may remember, in uh, I think 1991, OSHA issued its bloodborne pathogen standard. So that was that covered all blood, you know, diseases that were transmitted through the bloodborne route, which is mainly you know HIV and hepatitis uh, A B. Well, actually, actually hepatitis B and C and some other diseases. But OSHA had ne- and essentially, essentially what that did more or less was codify CDC guidance. But OSHA had never issued any other standards that would apply to any other communicable diseases. Airborne route. Those are transmitted through a dermal route, through touching, uh, oral, fecal, whatever. You know, there are many other other ways that, that communicable diseases are transmitted. None of those were covered except for bloodborne. So the idea behind the infectious disease standard, um, which we started in 2009 and kind of in the wake of H1N1, would have been basically to cover all the rest of the infectious diseases out there and, again, codify more or less uh, CDC guidance. We got somewhere on that, not really far enough. We never, we didn't quite get to uh, the proposal stage before the administration ended. And then the Trump administration put that, put it on the long-term agenda, which means that basically they weren't going to totally deep six it, but they weren't going to work on it either. Um, and that's where it, it remained until uh, I think last week, um, the Biden administration issued its first regulatory agenda and kind of released the infectious disease standard from the long-term agenda. So it's possible that we may see that in the in the coming months. Yeah, I don't know how many months. Again, it hasn't hasn't gotten to the uh, uh, proposal stage yet. And then, uh, again, I'll go back to complaining about the OSHA regulatory process. It can often be uh, you know a good two years just from the time the proposal is issued until a uh, standard is issued. And again, we aren't even at the at the proposal stage yet. So um, I would measure it probably more in years than in. Yeah, we've come full circle. Hey, Jordan, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been awesome. It's been a privilege to have you on here. Very, very informative. And thank you very, very much. Well, you're welcome. And thanks for inviting me. You bet. And stay tuned for the next episode of the Workplace Safety Review Podcast. 